Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Sainz and I'm the director of the Queensland Art Gallery, Gallery of Modern Art in Brisbane. I want to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet across the widest reaches of this platform. In the spirit of reconciliation, I recognise the continuing contribution of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders to our shared creative community. Together with Professor Caitlin Byrne, director of the Griffith Asia Institute, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you to this Perspectives Asia webinar. Thank you for joining us for another virtual outing of this series. Tonight, we're deeply honoured to be joined from Sydney by a very special guest, His Excellency Shingo Yamagami, Ambassador of Japan to Australia. Ambassador Yamagami joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan in 1984. His overseas assignments have included Washington, D.C., Hong Kong, Geneva, and London. In Tokyo, he served in a raft of senior diplomatic positions, including as Deputy Director General of the International Legal Affairs Bureau, Ambassador for Policy Planning and International Security Policy, and Acting Director General of the Japan Institute of International Affairs. He took the role of Assistant Minister, Director General of the Intelligence and Analysis Service in 2007, 2017, and went on to become Assistant Minister, Director General of the Economic Affairs Bureau the following year. In December 2020, he was dispatched to Canberra as Japanese Ambassador to Australia, and it's in this role that we're very pleased to welcome him tonight. The modern Japan-Australia bilateral relationship picked up momentum with the signing of the Australia-Japan Commerce Agreement in 1957. The agreement sparked a long-standing economic partnership that has grown from foundations in resources and agriculture to robotics, renewable energy, and financial services. Further enhancing our economic ties, the Japan-Australia Economic Partnership Agreement came into force in January, 2015. Complementing the economic relationship, are the cultural ties that manifest through sister city relationships, language le learning and people to people exchange in which I'm closely involved as a member of the Australian Japan Foundation. I could not be more pleased and honoured to introduce tonight's seminar, not least in light of Kogoma's own long and fruitful relationship with the people and the works of art of Japan. This has been borne out in particular through our Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art the 10th edition of which opens in early December. Every APT from the first has featured leading and emerging Japanese artists and strengthened the cultural bonds between our two countries. Tonight, Ambassador Yamagami will give a comprehensive overview of the Japan-Australia relationship and our economic ties and provide an insight into how our nations can collaborate to further strengthen and diversify this special strategic partnership, not least, of course, in the current context of COVID. Following the seminar, Ambassador Yamagami will take questions from viewers, which will be facilitated by Caitlin. You can share your questions at any time during the event through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. With that said, it's now my very great pleasure to welcome His Excellency, Ambassador Yamagami. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chris Sainz, for that kind introduction. I'd also like to thank Professor Katrin Byrne and the Greatest Asia Institute for having me this evening. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is lovely to be virtually in Brisbane, host of the 2032 Olympic Games. Many of you would have called some of the Tokyo Olympics and more recently, the Paralympics on television. I understand that a record number of Griffith University students, staff, and alumni qualified for the Games. The medal hall by athletes such as Emma McKeon and Rowan Crothers was truly something else. Japan learned a lot 
through holding Tokyo 2020. And we'd like to share anything that might be of help with Australia to ensure the success of the 2032 games. I know that Brisbaneites sometimes refer to their home city as Bris Vegas. With the closer ties, the organization of the games will bring. I am hoping we can change that, that Bris Tokyo. As Japan's ambassador to Australia, the thought of Japanese sporting fans having the chance to visit this beautiful sunshine state for the Olympics is very exciting. Queensland, as you would know, is already a popular destination for Japanese tourists. Before the pandemic hit, this state saw a yearly Japanese tourist count of some 212,000. That's around half of all Japanese visitors to Australia. These visitors contributed $463.5 million to the state economy. As recently as March this year, Treasurer Friedenberg reportedly recognized the high quality, high spending Japanese tourist market as a necessity for the Australian economy. When travel can safely resume, it would be incredible to see a Japanese tourist boom in Queensland like that of the 1990s. I'm sure that many Japanese people would be eager to stretch their legs of Safa's Paradise Beach, stroll through the greenery of the Dane tree, or take a happy snap by the big pineapple. I am here today to talk to you about current Japan-Australia ties. On these, there is much we can reflect and celebrate. Queensland should be particularly proud because it was here that one of the first major milestones in our relationship was reached. Exactly 125 years ago, the first Japanese mission in Australia was set up in Townsville. In the following year, 1897, a regular shipping service commenced between Yokohama and Sydney. Since then, our economic and diplomatic ties have grown exponentially. Australian exports to Japan now account for around 10% or $60 billion of Australia's total trade. And Japanese investment into Australia has accumulated to a massive total stock value of $100 and $32 billion. This makes Japan Australia's second largest investor. Our robust bilateral relations have expanded to multilateral cooperation too. The Quad is the epitome of such cooperation. The first ever Quad Leaders Summit meeting in March this year was held as a vehicle to promote our shared vision for a free and open in the Pacific. There, our nations agree to boost the manufacturing and distribution of up to 1 billion doses of vaccines in the Indo-Pacific. But of course, there is no use simply tooting our own home because there is more that we can achieve together. So today, while taking the time to reflect more deeply on our current ties, I hope to open up a conversation about what is ahead. What goals do Japan and Australia share that we can work towards? Where do our strengths and needs complement one another? These are the questions Japanese and Australian diplomats and business leaders are constantly asking. First, where we are now. You may have heard our relationship described as a special strategic partnership. It was in 2014 that the leaders of our nations elevated the relationship to this status. But what does this mean? Last year, when Prime Minister Scott Morrison flew to Japan to meet with newly elected Japanese Prime Minister Suga Yoshihide, despite the necessity of quarantine, 
the, the two readers reaffirmed this partnership. Together, they highlighted what makes it special. In their words, our relationship is special because it is based on both shared values and shared strategic interests. Furthermore, these built upon our strong business ties steeped in economic complementarity. Our shared values include a commitment to democracy, human rights, a market economy, and the rule of law. Our shared strategic interests are in the security, stability, and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific region and beyond. Adding to this, of course, are our cultural ties. So when we talk about our partnership as special, what we are highlighting is that our ties are both broad and deep. They cover a range of areas, economics, security, and cultural exchange. The longest of these are, of course, our economic ties. I've already mentioned how over a century ago, Japan's first mission opened in Townsville. But even before this milestone, Japanese businesses had recognized the great potential of our complementary strength and needs. Japanese trading houses, such as Kanematsu, Mitsu and Co, and Mitsubishi Corporation, for example, were doing business in Australia as early as 1890, 1901, and 1956, respectively. In the years that followed, all the resources came to dominate the Japanese market. Today, more than half of all Japan's coal and iron ore is bought from Australia, as is almost half of its LNG. As you know, much comes from Queensland, where Japanese companies have been working with their Aussie counterparts to find, dig, and ship the resources that have helped regional communities to flourish. In this regard, as you may know, Mitsubishi development and Idemitsu have played a large role. Australia agriculture products have been just as impactful. Aussie sugar has captured more than four-fifths of Japan's imported sugar market. Cheese, almost a quarter. And Aussie beef, almost a half. Here too, supply from Queensland makes up the lion's share. Around 30% of all of Queensland exported beef ends up on Japanese dinner tables. Indeed, Japan is this state's second largest export market. For Australia as a whole, the past 15 years alone have seen an incredible increase in trade and investment with Japan. Total trade between our nations have grown by around 60%. Investment has increased six old. One of the reasons Japan holds the position of Australia's second largest investor is because Japanese companies have faith in the Aussie market. They continue to reinvest their earnings from their Australian businesses. In Queensland, there are around 230 Japanese companies contributing to the local economy through job creation, taxes, and royalties. Over the past 15 years, these economic ties have been complemented by a growing security relationship. This relationship was spurred on by the signing of our joint declaration on security cooperation in 2007. The declaration has enabled us to cooperate in a myriad of ways to on issues including border security, maritime and aviation security, peace operations, and humanitarian relief operations. Japan and Australia have also been working towards the stability and security of our region with like-minded partners. In July, our nations participated in the exercise Talisman Seba 21, right here in this state. Along with Defense Minister Peter Dutton, I attended the opening ceremony of this impressive Australia-US exercise.
This year, it involved 17,000 personnel from seven different nations. Furthermore, just last month, the naval forces of Japan, Australia, the United States, and India were engaged in exercise Malabar in the Sea of Guam. Since 2007, our foreign affairs ministers and defense ministers have also been coming together for regular two plus two consultations. You may have heard that Japan and Australia are on the cusp of finalizing negotiations on another landmark agreement, the Reciprocal Access Agreement. In a sign of just how much Japan values our strategic relationship, this will be Japan's first visiting forces type agreement, adding to the existence existing status of forces agreement with the United States. The RAA provides a framework defining the legal status of defense personnel involved in activities within their counterparts' territory. It will open the way for more exercises, more exchanges, more information sharing, and more capability development. Moreover, Japan has already created a framework to allow the JSDF to protect ADF assets upon request. All of this defense cooperation between our two countries will lead to further enhancement of deterrence in our region, in the Pacific. Last, but definitely not least, we have our cultural exchange ties. It would be no exaggeration to say that the Japan-Australia relationship is built upon these vital people-to-people -to -people, people -to -people ties. Australia has the largest number of people per capita in the world learning Japanese. In Queensland alone, there are over 130 servants, which equates to 30% of Australia's total population of Japanese learners. That's just incredible, isn't it? We also share some truly inspiring sister city relationships. One of the hundred one of the 100 plus city sister city relationships our nations share, many of the oldest can be found here in Queensland. Queensland and Saitama since 1984, Brisbane and Kobe since 1985, and Townsville and Shunan Yamaguchi since 1990, as well as Iwaki Fukushima since 1991. These regions have been there for each other through good times and bad. In the wake of 1995, Kobe earthquake, the people of Brisbane raised thousands of dollars to help with the appeal. And when Iaki was devastated by the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, the leaders of Townsville offered their assistance along with their best wishes and condolences via a local radio broadcast. Australia is also a participant in Japan's JET program, which allows participants to live, work, and promote cultural exchange in Japan for up to five years. Before the pandemic, there were over 343 Australians living in Tokyo on the program. But we would love to see more of you here in Japan. I would recommend this program to all of you today with an interest in experience Japanese life. This brings me to the most important questions for today. How can we continue to grow such broad and deep ties? I would like to suggest to you there are at least three main areas we can focus on moving forward. These are improving our economic resilience, working together towards a carbon-free future, and deepening our cultural exchange ties. I spoke about how strong our trade and investment ties have become, but there is room for growth. The pandemic and growing challenges to the rules-based international order have been a stark reminder of the importance of diversifying trade and fostering economic resilience. 
one of my own personal goals during my time as ambassador is to help Australian producers promote their exports to Japan. It has been a great joy to discover so many beautiful, high quality meats, fruits and vegetables in this country. It is my belief that imports of Australian mangoes, for example, have not increased relative to their potential. Aussie mangoes, particularly from this state, already have an excellent reputation in Japan. Because of the difference in our seasonal calendar, Aussie mangoes can also be sold in Japan's off season. During Japan's autumn and winter months, the option of a high quality Queensland mango is certainly a tempting one. It would be wonderful to see this opportunity taken advantage of to the full. Trade diversification, of course, relies on the existence of a robust rules-based trading system. Japan and Australia understand that the preservation of this system benefits not only our nations, but our entire region, which is why it was together with Australia that Japan became the driving force behind the establishment of APEC. It is also together that we are working towards the expansion of the CPTPP. Japan and Australia have both been involved in examining the accession of the United Kingdom as chair and vice chair of the working group. Together, our two nations are also working closely towards reform of the WTO, including its dispute settlement mechanism. I have high hopes in our ability to transform this most vital institution. Japan understands the importance of having an impartial global empire. When unjustified export restrictions were placed on rare earth minerals in 2010, Japan, along with the United States and the European Union, brought that case to the WTO. We were able to claim victory in that dispute. This lesson also taught Japan about the need to ensure one egg and all in the same basket. Since then, it has brought its dependence on rare earth from one source from 85% down to 63%. One of those new sources of rare earth was, of course, Australia. In their bilateral talks last year, our two prime ministers publicly agreed that trade should never be used as a tool to apply political pressure. They stated that to do so undermines trust and prosperity. This is a message which will continue to underline the importance of the rules-based trading system for the years to come. Looking ahead, Japanese and Australian businesses and households are increasingly focused on tackling the challenge of climate change. With our long history of economic complementarity in the resources sector, Japan and Australia are natural partners in this global endeavor. Last year in December, Japan published its 2050 carbon neutrality roadmap, the Green Growth Strategy. In it, we outlined our ambition to be using up to 3 million tons of hydrogen each year by 2030. By 2050, our goal is to increase this to up to 20 million tons. Just like Australia, Japan is committed to a technology-led response to climate change. Like Australia, it sees hydrogen as the future. As such, Japan is eager to see Australia succeed in its endeavor to become a world leader in hydrogen production and exports. In June this year, our nations announced the Japan-Australia partnership on decarbonization through technology. In it, we outlined our shared ambition to accelerate the development and commercialization of low and zero emissions technologies. Already our business communities have taken up the challenge. There are dozens of Japan-backed hydrogen and ammonia projects underway all over Australia. 
Many of them are right here in Queensland. Kawasaki Heavy Industries is assess assessing the potential of a green hydrogen production facility in Townsville. In Western Downs, IHI Corporation and CS Energy are studying feasibility for the Kogan hydrogen demonstration project. The Queensland University of Technology is leading a collaborative research project with partners like the University of Tokyo, Sumitomo Electric, to establish a pilot plant producing hydrogen from renewable, renewable energy. In the latest development, NAOS has begun a joint study with Origin Energy for CO2-free hydrogen supply chain. Meanwhile, in Gladstone, Japanese companies clearly have their eyes on the region to become Australia's first renewable hydrogen hub. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries is funding H2U's proposal for a renewable hydrogen and ammonia hub. Itochu has signed an MOU with Australian Future Energy to participate in its energy and ammonia project. And most recently, Sumitomo Corporation and Rio Tinto announced a joint study into the utilization of hydrogen at Rio's Yawang Alumina refinery. The vast potential of hydrogen could very well be the key to significant emissions reduction and hail a new golden era for the industries of our two nations. I also spoke earlier about our strong cultural ties. These two have the potential to be nurtured further. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought considerable challenge to the Australia's university sector. But it is with considerable sadness that I note the trend of diminishing Australian language studies departments across Australia. I'm certain that former Australian ambassador to Japan, Mr. Bruce Miller, would agree when I say that Japanese language studies can take you far. His impeccable Japanese skills, which he picked up throughout university, enabled him to spearhead some of the most significant developments in our bilateral relationship. It was during his time as ambassador that our relationship was elevated to a special strategic partnership. The all important Japan-Australia economic partnership, which was supported uh, uh, lies in our two-way trade of some 31% was also signed. For those of you who aren't considering a career path in diplomacy, I would like to bring your attention to Australian artist, Gautier. Before his worldwide hit, somebody that I used to know, he went to Japan on exchange and studied Japanese at university. This in enabled him to connect more closely with his Japanese fans during his, tu his tours and make several appearances on Japanese television. I hope that one day I will be able to see more Australians rising to great popularity and acclaim in my country, thanks to their language skills. With heightened Japanese language skills, more Aussies will also be able to enjoy trips to Japan at a deeper, more satisfying level. Many Australians already enjoy getting deep into Japan's powder snow in ski resorts like Hakuba. But with language skills, they could enjoy getting deeper into the community and discover hidden gems of the beaten track. To conclude, I would like to reiterate that we have much to celebrate when it comes to Japan-Australia ties. We are connected through shared values, shared strategic interests, strong business and cultural ties. As we move forward, I am confident that we can deepen and broaden these ties through further cooperation. Together, we can ensure our nations are economically resilient. We can lower our emissions and meet our climate goals. And we can enjoy our bilateral ties to the fullest by strengthening our cultural understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Your Excellency Ambassador, just a fabulous and comprehensive review of the relationship 
in such optimistic terms. We are really truly grateful to you for giving us your time this evening. And I was going to start off with a couple of questions that I had for you, but I can see questions are coming in at the rate of knots. So um, just to those in our audience, it's fabulous to have you here. Please do keep putting your questions in and, and we will certainly come to those. Uh, the ambassador has very generously suggested that he's very open to responding to questions. Before I do go to questions though, can I say congratulations to you and of course to Japan. I think all of us here were watching with great hope um, in to, to see the success of the Olympics and the Paralympics this year. Congratulations, you know, under such difficult circumstances to have pulled that off is truly remarkable. And thank you for your shout out to Griffith University. Um, I have a feeling, and, I, and there might be some in the audience who can correct me, if we, if we took the tally of Griffith uh, University athletes who participated, we, we might have made a, a place somewhere on the top 10 medal-winning medal countries. Um, so we certainly did do very well and we're very proud of that. But look, let me get to those questions. Uh, I'm going to take one because I, that I think is on the minds of many people particularly today. It's come through from Ian Hall, Deputy Director of the Griffith Asia Institute, who has asked uh, about the announcement today that Australia will acquire nuclear submarines with assistance from the US and, and the UK. Could you please give your view of these decisions and what you see are the implications for regional security? Well, thank you very much for your you know, kind words, you know, Catherine. And uh, before I answer the question posed by Ian, as always, you know, he asked me a tough question. Uh, but uh, I'd like to make some uh, comment about the Olympics because uh, I wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to express my deep appreciation to people in Australia. You know, uh, we have been, uh, you know, uh, valued for holding the Olympics in, uh, you know, safe and uh, secure manner. But it was, you know, uh, made possible only with cooperation from countries like Australia. In fact, Australia was the first country to, you know, send its team, uh, all the spirit, women's softball team all the way to Japan. They were the first one to have arrived. And I couldn't emphasize more how much that, you know, fact, you know, lifted our spirits up. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, you know, my appreciation goes to Australia and Australian athletes. In fact, you know, uh, my embassy was inundated uh, by a number of letters and emails, even a bouquet of flowers from all these congratulating us. And we really appreciate. This is a kind of bond uh, we are privileged to have with Australia. And going on to submarines, uh, well, uh, I think this is a historic momentous day for Australia. And uh, I was very much impressed by how you know they thoroughly gave uh, you know careful you know consideration to this uh, epoch making uh, initiative and uh, in that regard you know this is very very important in terms of maintaining and peace and security in our region i'm talking about in the pacific you know region this will certainly increase you know deterrence so Japan is more than delighted to work even more closely with Australia and US and UK in this regard. That announcement did draw some commentary from the region, including from uh, New Zealand's Prime Minister, uh, Jacinda Ardern, and some commentary from Pacific Island nations. Mm -hmm. um, and there were certainly some sensitivities. And, and I guess that that reflects on the heightened focus for Australia too in thinking about Pacific neighbours. And the next question relates to our Pacific region and whether you see opportunities for Australia and Japan to work trilaterally with Pacific Island countries, Vanuatu, PNG, Tonga. And if so, which areas do you think are most appropriate for this type of cooperation in terms of addressing 
specific priorities. And I note that question comes from Tess Newton Kane, who heads up our Pacific Hub here at the Institute. Okay. Well, uh, uh, before you know, uh, I answer the question about the you know, Pacific Island, you know, uh, cooperation. Uh, let me say a few words about you know this sensitivity about you know anything nuclear, because coming from Japan, I think I'm entitled to say something about you know, nuclear you know, repercussions because Japan is the only country which suffered from nuclear devastation uh, during wartime, Hiroshima, Nagasaki experiences. But that said, you know, uh, we are also cognizant of the need to you know, make better use of nuclear energy for civilian purposes. So uh, in this regard, you know, uh, nuclear energy has been very much you know, uh, appreciated and it was a sort of you know, necessity in Japanese electricity uh, production. And also we are you know, fully aware of the sensitivity on the part of neighboring countries. That's why you know, uh, we are going great length in explaining the rationale uh, behind you know, this decommissioning of Fukushima nuclear power plant including this uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, processed uh, water uh, coming out from nuclear power plant. Uh, we are making, redoubling our efforts to explain the safety of you know, this process, processed water to our friends in Pacific Island countries. And on top of that, you know, coming back to the question, what we can do together between Australia and Japan in terms of helping our partners and friends, you know, on Pacific Island countries, uh, I see, you know, the potential is enormous. Already, we are helping them to develop, you know, infrastructure, and Japan has been, you know, extending its, you know, economic assistance for many decades. And uh, in light of the current difficulties facing them, uh, Japan is helping to provide you know, vaccines uh, to you know, many of those island countries along with Australia. So you know, in terms of you know, infrastructure connectivity or regional development or public health issue, there are so many areas you know, which we can cooperate together vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Pacific Island countries. So the next question takes a slightly different perspective. Uh, this comes from Sebastian, who's asking uh, your thoughts on the importance of resuming student exchanges and international study between our two nations in mm. a post-COVID era. Mm. What is your outlook on the possibility of restoring these valuable cultural and people-to-people -people engagements in the near future? As I you know, emphasized in my opening statement today, uh, I see you know, this you know, people to people ties is an important pillar of our bilateral relationship. So in that regard, you know, student exchange is important and also you know, promotional tourism is important too. Uh, we have seen a number of Japanese students you now coming to Australia and we would like to see more of them coming to Australia and vice versa, you know, from Australia to Japan as well. Because after all, you know, you know, if you understand the language or lifestyle or culture of our friends, you know, you have, you know, deeper ties. And uh, I mentioned the example of, you know, uh, Gautier and I mentioned the example of uh, Ambassador Bruce Miller. And uh, there are many, many great examples of language study leading to you know, deeper ties. And I would like to see you know, more, more of that. Uh, in my capacity here as ambassador, I'm doing my best to study more about Australia. So I'm spending my extra time in watching movie, Aussie movies and reading Aussie novels. There is a lot for us to learn. And, you know, I think uh, the sky is the limit. You know, there is a lot we can do, you know, together in that regard. After all, we are destined to live in this region, in the Pacific. And uh, that's the difference between Australia on the one hand and some other, you know, English speaking countries, 
say, you know, Europe or you know, North, North America. Australia in that regard has an advantage. And if that's the case, you no know, language study would make Australia more special in this region. I think there will be many in the audience who agree with you and are extremely heartened to hear your words and, and certainly your words of encouragement for thinking about lifting our language studies. Certainly that's something we're very keen to do here. And we've been so lucky with some of our students actually picking up business internships as well, um, that we've been able to continue in a virtual sense, but there's nothing quite like being mm -hmm. in the country and having your feet on the ground. The next question does take a, a slightly similar line in terms of asking your opinion on how young people and the next generation of leaders will be able to engage and participate in the Australia-Japan bilateral relationship. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, before I came here, I, know I was talking with some uh, uh, members of you know, uh, Japanese Parliamentary League to promote you know, OZ Japan relationship. And uh, you know, I found you know there could be more you know we can do in terms of promoting exchange of you know young you know young politicians mm -hmm. uh, and also you know uh, scholars you know people you know in academia. So uh, yes, uh, you know, like I said, you know we are you know, fully cognizant of the importance of cooperation within our region in the Pacific. And uh, in order to promote further cooperation, after all, you know, it uh, boils down to people to, you know, people -to -people ties. Mm. Yes, Australia has, uh, you know, uh, same, you know, share language, you know, history, lifestyle, you know, even culture is, uh, for example, you know, uh, the other members of five Irish countries. But when it comes to this region, in the Pacific region, in terms of sharing, you know, basic values like democracy, market economy, the rule of law, respect for human rights, and shared strategic interest, I think, you know, Japan is a natural, natural partner of Australia. And we do regard Australia as Japan's natural partner. So let's get on to the work and we can, you know, further build upon, you know, our past achievements. The next question comes from Michael Hazel, who is uh, affiliated to Griffith Asia Institute. He's based in Kyoto. Michael, it's fabulous to have you in our virtual room. Um, and, and it, you know, Michael's been very, very instrumental in building our relationship from the Institute through our dialogue processes over the last decade. So um, we're really pleased to have you here, Michael. His question is this. Does Japan intend to continue increasing its support for maritime law enforcement capacity building among Southeast Asian states? And is the Japanese government concerned about the decline in Australian funding to Southeast Asia since 2014? Mm. Well, it is always nice to hear from Michael. And uh, you know, I am also aware of his contribution to you know, Griff, you know, Griffiths Asia Institute. And uh, when I went there, you know, several years ago to make a presentation, he was there. So I vividly recall those days. And uh, he had an you know, excellent point about the importance of maritime security. And uh, yes, no, this year marks the fifth anniversary of this awarding of arbitration, arbitral you know, uh, tr tribunal uh, under the UNCLOS. And, uh, you know, I think uh, every student of international law is you know, aware that under the UNCLOS, you know, any party has an uh, obligation to accept this kind of, you know, award as something final and legally binding. Yet one particular country continues to call it a waste paper. This is a kind of environment in East, you know, in the Pacific region, we would like to see completely changed. After all, we are all living under the rules-based order, regional and international order. So in that regard, there is a lot Australia and Japan can do together in terms of, you know, shoring up 
or, or beefing up you know, this uh, you know, cooperation and even you know, awareness of the you know, importance of maritime law and maritime, you know, maritime security. Uh, you know, I, I, I could see in that context you know, the importance of joint operation you know, throughout South China Sea and East China Sea. After all, after all, any member of this region is entitled to you know, the right of you know, uh, navigation, uh, freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight. And this shouldn't be you know, infringed upon by any irresponsible behavior on the part of a particular you know, member of this region. Mm. And, and actually, this earlier this year, the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies in uh, Singapore released its annual survey on the state of, of Southeast Asia. And, and in that survey, it looks at perceptions of, of other countries in Southeast Asia, their political influence, their economic influence, how uh, they've responded to Southeast Asia and supported Southeast Asia through COVID. It was really interesting to me that Japan featured extremely positively through mm -hmm. that survey, you know, ranking highly on just about every measure. Also alongside China, the EU, the US. Australia didn't really uh, feature all that much in the rankings. And I wonder, Ambassador, if we have something to learn from Japanese diplomacy in the region. Well, no, no, as a Japanese diplomat, you know, uh, unlike some other countries, you know, uh, we are not adept at lecturing and hectoring. So I'm not here to preach you. I'm quite sure Australia's rank will, you know, go up soon. But, you know, uh, if you ask me about, you know, Japan's experience, I think, uh, you know, throughout, uh, you know, post Second World War, you know, history, uh, I think uh, it's fair to say we have learned the importance of equal partnership. Uh, yes, you know, uh, there are, you know, differences in terms of economic development. There are differences in terms of, you know, size or population. But irrespective of these differences, after all, you know, each nation, each sovereign nation is equal in front of the international law. That's the essence of the you know, living in international community. So we don't call any country a smaller nation, a tiny nation, not like that. No, there has to be mutual respect and tolerance here. And that's the kind of lesson I think we Japanese have learned throughout modern history. We were really pleased actually to also host in partnership with the AAA, and I know you spoke with the AAA earlier in the week, uh, a friend of yours, I believe, Professor Takahara uh, uh -huh. from the University of Tokyo, who spoke really eloquently to the way that Japan has had to learn to utilize levers of cooperation and competition, particularly in negotiating you know, its relationship with China. I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Well, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, China or whether it's, uh, you know, Southeast Asian nation or whether it's uh, Pacific Island nations, I think, the, you know, this importance of, uh, you know, equal partnership, you know, plays, you know, uh, comes into play. So, uh, you know, uh, yes, you know, we are eager to, you know, solve issue you know in accordance with international law and through you know through dialogue you know keep on sending balls to territorial waters of japanese islands or keep on you know uh, exercising you know uh, import restraints from you know australia goods and services that's not the way to address the issues, you know, in front of us. So, uh, you know, I'd like to see, you know, uh, responsible, law-abiding behavior from any member of, you know, in the in the Pacific region. And in that regard, you know, always, you know, it has to come with self-reflection. Are we up to the standard? Is Australia up to the standard? Is Japan up to the standard? We are being tested each and every single day. And like I said, 
I don't want to lecture, you know, we don't want to hector, but after all, we would like to, you know, create uh, this region, you know, uh, abiding by international laws and regulations and respecting each other's sovereignty. And you mentioned uh, the situation with rare earths earlier in your discussion. A question's come through from Christian Wells around how you see, um, whether you see exports of rare earths from Australia to Japan through companies like Linus increasing in the future. And do you consider that, that these kinds of exports will be an important component of our strategic relationship going forward? Well, for example, anybody has a smartphone and lithium battery is a must. So in order to you know, create lithium battery, you know, we need a certain amount of rare earth minerals. You know, that's one example. So in order to live in a, you know, this world, uh, you know, rare earth is certainly a must. Uh, and uh, after facing you know, this uh, uh, export uh, restraints, on the part of particular source. Japan tried its you know, best to you know, diversify risks, diversify the source of rare earth minerals. And here, Australia play a pivotal role. And uh, as you mentioned, you know, Catherine, Linus Corporation did help us a lot. But at the same time, this was a joint, you know, result of joint cooperation between Australia and Japan. So in this regard, you know, we are help, you know, willing to help Australia diversify its export destinations. Mm -hmm. For example, wine, you know, I talked about, you know, Queensland mangoes that day, uh, but also, you know, Australian wine could be more exported, you know, to, to the Japanese market. We are yet to see quality wine from Australia on Japanese average household. That's a pity. So, you know, taking advantage of the current, you know, uh, situation, uh, I think time is ripe for Australian exporters to look at alternative markets such as Japan or India or many other Southeast Asian countries. Mm. You've certainly given us some challenges in, in you know, thinking about our mangoes and, and, and our wine. So I hope that we're able to pick up on some of those things. There is, of course, another challenge around climate change. And you did speak to you know, joint aspirations for a decarbonised future. Um, of course, climate change policy, and this, this is a question that comes from Mark Fanane, mm -hmm. climate change policy is highly politicised in Australia. And there are strong views on both sides of the questions. Are you able to comment on popular and po political attitudes in Japan on the future directions in climate change policy? I think uh, climate change, this effect of climate change is uh, you know, uh, beginning to be felt you know, more vividly by you know, uh, ordinary people in Japan. For example, if you look at the you know, weather situation in Japan these days, you know, torrential, you know, rain or, uh, you know, succession of typhoons, you know, hitting Japan, it's just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you know, uh, what else are the reasons, you know, climate change. And certainly, you know, this is affecting our daily life. So the importance of addressing this uh, vitally important, you know, global issue is on the mind of you know many Japanese you know policymakers. And in this regard, yes, you know, it could be a political divisive issue, but after all, we need joint efforts to tackle you know this difficult issue. That's why I said you know the importance of hydrogen projection cooperation between Australia and Japan, you know, we believe in innovation. So rather than pointing a finger at, you know, uh, each other's response, now is the time for us to redouble our efforts for cooperation. That is my take. And speaking of technology and innovation and, and new frontiers, potentially, we have a question about uh, space tech, the space technology industry. Mm -hmm. And really, is there potential, do you see, for Australia and Japan to advance joint activities in advancing this sector, especially in Queensland? 
Oh, yes, yeah, definitely. And uh, I always say, you know, there are a number of areas, you know, in enlarging the horizon of, you know, economic cooperation between our two countries. And uh, space cooperation is definitely, you know, one of those uh, examples. And whether Queensland or whether, you know, South Australia, we know we have been engaging in some cooperative activities, including this you know, Hayabusa 2 capsule landing in Umera, South Australia, you know, uh, several months ago. So uh, this is just you know, one of so many examples to come. Uh, so definitely I'm for you know, further cooperation uh, on the space front. The questions have been really far reaching, uh, Ambassador, and you've been incredible in just seamlessly moving from topic to topic. I might pose one last question to you, if that's okay, and I do apologise uh, to those in the audience whose questions I haven't been able to get to. Uh, this comes from Professor Panendra Jain, another uh, academic who has been affiliated with Griffith University. Uh, who has asked about subnational governments, and you spoke to the fact we've got strong sister city ties. Mm -hmm. um, but his question really is about how can we cooperate in areas beyond education and culture? You've already highlighted some of those. For example, in making localities carbon mm -hmm. neutral, for you know, as many J Japanese local governments have also announced. Mm -hmm. I think. Uh... You know, here, you know, it's up to, you know, innovation or ingenuity of you know, uh, many, many local communities. And uh, certainly we have sister to sister relationship, but uh, we certainly need to build upon this existing, you know, framework and cooperation. In this regard, you know, I would like to highlight the importance of uh, infrastructure development kind of you know, smart city type concept. Already in Western Sydney, Japanese business heavyweights are helping Western Sydney to improve its infrastructure. And this is one of the examples, you know, and certainly when it comes to you know, local infrastructure, the needs are very well understood by local people and they can learn, you know, Australians and Japanese communities can learn from each other's experiences. Certainly I'm impressed by the beauty of you know streets of you know Canberra, you know, this you know well established you know on uh, bike roads just so impressive. And you know, Japan can learn from this, but at the same time, you know, in terms of you know technology or utilization of you know smart city type, you know, innovation, uh, Japan has something to offer to Australia. So this could be uh, a win-win situation between our two countries. Mm. Ambassador, Your Excellency, thank you so much. You've really delivered an incredibly comprehensive picture of the Australia-Japan relationship. Uh, you know, I, I noticed also when Chris delivered his introduction, um, we do we do like to look back and think about the depth of ties between our two countries. Fabulous that Queensland has a relationship that spans 125 years. Um, what I think has been fantastic though from you tonight as well is to cast forward, to look at what does the next 10, 15, 50 years look like and, and where are the real challenges going to be and where will our real points of cooperation and convergence lay. And I think you've given us a great deal to think about in terms of our economic resilience, our thinking about a decarbonized future together, despite the differences we may have in, in some aspects of that, but also thinking about how we maintain our connections, people to people, institution to institution and nation to nation. So from mangoes, we didn't get to magpies, but from mangoes to space, uh, we really appreciate your thoughts and insights across all of these topics. Uh, I would like to thank our audience. You've been fantastic in supplying excellent questions that have been fabulously wide ranging. I hope I did them justice in asking them. Uh, I know there were some that we missed and I do apologize. I should also mention it's great uh, to have Bruce Miller, I believe, in the audience, uh, whose name did come up tonight. Bruce, thank you for joining us. 
Uh, and finally, just thanks to you, Chris, to the team at uh, Quagoma and also the team here at Griffith Asia Institute for making tonight happen. But of course, very special thanks, Your Excellency, to you, Ambassador. Just such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having me. We look forward to seeing you here in person, hopefully before the end of the year. Next time, let's sink a tinny of gold together. <laughs> I'll go for the wine. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Take care and good night. Thank you.